right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to April. Um, we've sprung forward, and now it's time for the uh, SVS and JVS Vascular Online Journal Club. Um, this month, I'll, let me share my screen real quick, and I will kind of go over some of the introductions. We are excited this month to have two groups from Atrium Health, as well as from the Jobs Vascular Institute, and also authors from both groups to talk about their, their papers. The Association of Ruptured Abdominal Aortic Aneurysm Diameter with Mortality and the International Consortium of Vascular Registries. And then of course, Aortic Endarterectomy in Patients with Severe Multivessel, Parabyssal, and Aortoiliac Occlusive Disease. Um, from Atrium Health, we have Dr. Charlie Briggs, who has been with us before, and we're thrilled to have him back. Um, and also Dr. Joe Wassell, who is his first year fellow. Um, from the Jobst Institute, we have Dr. Oriolo, who is a clinical assistant professor there, and Dr. Lamb, who is a fellow, a first year fellow also, who will be reviewing uh, the other manuscript. And then of course the authors. It's always great when we have authors here and we're really delighted to have Dr. Uh, Manar Kashram as well as Dr. Jillian Mao um, to kind of answer questions and field different uh, questions that come up about their work. And then Dr. Claire Moidel and Dr. Benjamin Pierce also with us. Um, just a few little, uh, oh, before that. And then of course we have our moderator guests. This is one of the great things is having editorial board members participate. Dr. April Boyd, who's been with us before, um, also excited to have her back. And then Dr. Al Pham, who is an assistant professor um, at Virginia Tech in the Emory and Henry College of Health Sciences. Just a couple of housekeeping things. We ask that you please stay muted. We will encourage you to put your questions and comments in the chat for the moderator to call on you. The event is being recorded. It's for on-demand access. And then, of course, we uh, we will be doing this again in May. So May 8th at 6 p.m. Central Time. We have UT Southwestern and St. Louis University, who are um, the host institutions. All of the dates for 2024 are posted there at vascular or, or vascular.org in case for the groups that do this as a group and you wanna set everything up in advance, everything is posted all the way through December and then the recordings are there as well. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and we will allow Dr. Briggs to take us away. Thank you very much, Misty, I really appreciate it. Let me share my, I believe I sh I'm sharing it now. Um, I can get this to come to. That looks great if you want to just put it in presentation mode. Yeah, if only, right? Let's see here. Here we go. So, uh, again, a big thanks to Dr. Forbes and Dahlman, uh, Dr. Misty Humphreys and Paul DiMuzio, uh, Dr. April Boy and Hal Pham, and then our authors, Claire Modal, Ben Pierce, and Adam Beck, and a big thanks to the SVS for always organizing this. I loved this paper because uh, I'm a history buff and I was a history major at the College of William and Mary. And so this got me a chance to do a deep dive into the history of open surgery. Um, in 1946, uh, Dr. Dos Santos performed the first femoral endarterectomy and then it sort of evolved uh, through uh, endarterectomy and bypass grafting through the 40s and 50s uh, to sort of where we are today. As I mentioned, Dr. Dos Santos of Portugal was the first one to perform a th successful thromboendarterectomy. This was established, this was able to establish the procedure as feasible. His first operation was on the left uh, femoral artery, but somehow he did an endarterectomy on a subclavian artery as well, which sounds uh, you know, technically difficult, but I guess you know, feasible. I love to know that disobliteration was the initial term for this operation that eventually became, uh, came to be known as a thromboendarterectomy or just endarterectomy. And Dr. Dos Santos has been honored uh, by a representation on stamps in Portugal. The operation was brought to the United States in uh, the 40s and 50s, where in 1951, the first successful aortic endarterectomy was done by Jack Wiley in San Francisco. And as I mentioned, it's gradually given way to bypass grafting. Bypass grafting, of course, was the brainchild of Rene LaRiche, who gave his name to the syndrome of uh, aortoiliac occlusion. Uh, his preferred treatment was aortoiliac arterial resection, 
uh, reestablishment of graft patencies through homograft implantation and then bilateral lumbar sympathectomy. This operation was first completed by Jacques Houdot, uh, though the Achilles heel of the operation was homograft placement. In the 50s, uh, Dr. Michael DeBakey uh, and his group began working on various materials for grafts, and he collaborated with a Philadelphia textile engineer to create seamless Dacron grafts of all sizes, shapes, and configurations, uh, and various refinements were made. He did publish his data in 1958, as you can see, before the American Surgical Association in New York, uh, where their outcomes were measured as the operation being successful or not, and whether the patient died or not. Uh, these were uh, really nice outcomes uh, that uh, we should all strive for. And then on the bottom, you can see that the Dacron knit had the, had the best outcomes and uh, uh, did very well. Uh, with the advent of prosthetic graft in the 50s, uh, like I said, uh, endorectomy is largely replaced by aortofemoral bypass grafting. The other reason for that is because the operation, the pathology frequently involved the external iliac arteries, which are difficult to treat with endorectomy. However, as Dr. Moto will show, uh, aortoiliac uh, endorectomy may be associated with superior outcomes, including improved 10-year patency and lower rates of aneurysm formation. Again, the aortoiliac endorectomy, in particular the visceral segment, has historical interest, as this paper was published in 1980 uh, by John Ricotta. Uh, but it is helpful to relieve uh, a, a coral reef aorta, uh, which was coined in 1984 by Dr. Stoney. Uh, which describes heavily calcified plaque within the uh, renal visceral aorta. Um, so the aim of the present study was to characterize outcomes of aortic endarterectomy for severe multi-level paravisceral or aortoiliac occlusive disease in a contemporary patient population. Uh, and as Dr. Modal notes, uh, she presents an extended case series of patients undergoing paravisceral or aortoiliac endarterectomy demonstrating that this procedure can be an excellent alternative with acceptable morbidity and mortality in select patients. Uh, I have asked my first year fellow, Dr. Joe Wassell, who's a native Floridian, having matriculated from University of Florida through the South Florida Medical School and General Surgery Program, is now our first year fellow to present the paper. Thank you, Dr. Briggs. Let me come out of this. Um, if I can find it. There you go. All right. Can everybody see my screen? We can. There you go. That looks great. Perfect. Uh, well, uh, thank you, everybody. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Briggs. Um, I'm Joseph Wassell, one of the first year fellows at Atrium Health uh, for vascular surgery. Uh, today, I'm going to present a paper uh, that came out of uh, UAB uh, titled Aortic Endorectomy in Patients with the Severe Multivessel Paravisceral and Aortoiliac Occlusive Disease. So this was a single institution retrospective review um, of patients who were undergoing aortic endarterectomy between the years of 2017 and 2023. The outcomes measured were in hospital mortality, perioperative complications, reinterventions, and postoperative ABI, as well as one year patency. Um, the patient characteristics, there was a mean age of 56 years old, but there was a wide range between 35 and 82. Uh, the majority of these patients were female, 70%, or 14 out of 20, and 30% of these patients had prior endovascular intervention. The authors um, split this uh, group of patients into their anatomical uh, presentation of disease, that being paravisceral, which was five of those uh, patients, and infrarenal, which was 15. Other than the age and the genders of these patients, um, as you can see, they were mostly similar. The paravisceral group had a much uh, higher age, the mean being 70 versus 51. And in the paravisceral group with uh, these five patients, they were all female. However, on, on both groups, as you can see, the majority were female. Um, so to start the review of this, uh, this case series, uh, we have the first five patients, which were all treated with a paravisceral endarterectomy. And the authors present a detailed um, review of each of these patients. So we'll briefly uh, touch on each of them. 
Uh, this first patient is an 82-year-old female. She had severe bilateral rest pain. A uh, CT scan revealed a coral reef plaque, and essentially she had an occlusion at the level of the renal arteries. She undergoes a paravisceral endarterectomy with a bovine patch um, via retroperitoneal approach, and this results in complete resolution of her rest pain. As you can see, they demonstrate her ABIs here, which is a significant improvement. Our next patient is a 62-year-old female. Uh, she presents with chronic abdominal pain, weight loss. She has a CT scan that reveals occlusions of the celiac and SMA, uh, but she does have a patent IMA. Um, essentially, the entire aorta is heavily calcified, which precludes a mesenteric bypass, and the SMA itself is severely circumferentially calcified, and there's no access for a retrograde stent. Uh, she undergoes a uh, medial visceral rotation, and she does. She gets an SMA endarterectomy with a patch angioplasty onto it, and a celiac artery aversion endarterectomy with transposition to the SMA. This was all done with side bedding clamps, and she recovers and does well postoperatively. Our next patient is 64-year-old female. She has chronic mesenteric ischemia and severe claudication bilaterally. She has a coral reef plaque on CT scan, and she undergoes a retroperitoneal endarterectomy of the aorta, celiac, SMA, and bilateral renals, and this is patched with a Dacron uh, patch angioplasty. She has resolution of her symptoms, uh, but as you can see here, at about 10 months uh, postoperatively, she has a recurrence of um, <clears throat> essentially chronic mesenteric ischemia, and this was due to a stenosis at the distal endpoint of the endarterectomy. Um, our next patient, a 69-year-old female, she presents with uh, progressively and severe acutely worsening abdominal pain. Uh, she's diagnosed with acute on chronic mesenteric ischemia, and a CT scan demonstrates an SMA occlusion. She undergoes an emergent exploration, and she's found to have a gangrenous and ruptured gallbladder. So rather than a visceral bypass with prosthetic material, a trapdoor endarterectomy is performed. Um, <clears throat> of the SMA and celiac. She has recurrent symptoms that um, come about about one month postoperatively, and she's treated with an SMA stent at that distal endpoint um, there as well. And then this final patient, 72-year-old female, she presents with abdominal pain, claudication, and weight loss. She has a near total occlusion of the celiac and a long segment occlusion of the SMA and severe calcific disease of the aorta and iliac arteries. She undergoes a trapdoor endarterectomy, including the celiac SMA and bilateral renal arteries, and she has a patch angioplasty onto the SMA. Um, her course is complicated by occlusion of the celiac artery and an occlusion of the SMA on post-op day zero, which was due to an intimal flap, um, and she is brought back and revascularized um, <clears throat> by extending that patch angioplasty. And then the celiac artery was revascularized using a occluded IMA conduit that is endarterectomized for an SMA to hepatic artery bypass. She did die uh, 106 days later, and this was due to pneumonia. For the remainder of the patients in the study, they underwent an infrarenal aortoiliac endarterectomy. This were 15 total patients. Um, this was the primary procedure for 10 of them, and five of them had a prior intervention that was done endovascularly. Uh, the overwhelming majority had chronic limb-threatening ischemia. One patient had acute limb ischemia, and another had acute on-chronic limb ischemia. Uh, those patients who had prior endovascular intervention had those stents explanted during the procedure. Two of these patients in total required re-intervention. One of them was early within one year, and one of them was late after one year. Um, both of these patients had thrombosis um, of their iliac arteries, um, and both of them were reconstructed with the NACE. So looking at the aggregate outcomes that are reported from this case series, you can see that there's no mortality in either group uh, for all 20 patients. Um, there is a higher complication rate with the paravisceral uh, group, which is, I think, expected about 40%. Uh, for the infrarenal group, I would say that's a low complication rate, 6.6%. Um, you can also see um, 
the post-operative ABIs, which are recorded here, um, and then the primary patency. So for the paravisceral group, patency at one year for primary patency is 40%, primary assisted is 80%, and secondary patency at one year is 100%. For the infrarenal group, the primary patency is 91%, primary assisted is also 91%, and then secondary patency is 100%. So to just highlight some of the discussion, um, so coral reef aortic plaques, much more common in women, um, as you can see by the reports in the literature, 62% versus 38. Um, when you cannot get a, a revascularization by other means, that being mesenteric bypass, visceral stenting, retrograde stenting, that's where uh, this plays a role. And exposure is guided by the distribution of disease, as you can see by the uh, patients that are uh, presented in this study, with retroperitoneal being more preferred when you have osteovisceral lesions, and then transperitoneal if you have to really extend down onto the visceral vessels. Uh, the most common complication seen in, in this case series of patients for the paravisceral group was um, the distal endarterectomy endpoint. Um, and the authors mentioned now that they're using intraoperative ultrasound at the end of these cases uh, to identify this before it becomes an issue. And then uh, we discussed trapdoor and arterectomy for avoiding prosthetic material. In the aortoiliac group, um, this is described as being preferable for patients who um, <clears throat> have focal disease that does not extend deep into the external iliac artery. And this is because it's difficult to do an endarterectomy at that point. And that's where an aorta bifemoral bypass would be preferable. Um, the advantage though over an endarterectomy is uh, the improvement in pelvic perfusion, um, especially for patients who may even have sacral ulcers, for example. Uh, but overall, the, the authors do um, say that this is a very selective procedure. Only 15 of their cases uh, versus 198 aortoiliac or femoral uh, bypasses. And then uh, briefly discussed uh, prevention of retrograde ejaculation, which can be prevented by avoiding transection of this plex plexus overlying the left common iliac artery. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I think this case series really uh, shows us that there are good outcomes with this. It's very feasible, uh, no mortality in this group, um, and the morbidity is acceptable, and it remains a viable option for well-selected patients. And that's that. Let me see if I can... Um... Stop there. We'll have you stop sharing and then we'll let's start the moderating. Um, so this is my turn, right? <laughs> so I, I have yeah. to commend the authors on being able to get together that many cases. I polled my colleagues at a recent meeting, a Canadian meeting, and knowing this was coming up and asked, how many times have you done this in the last year? And most of them said zero. Many of them said, um, I often set out in cases where I can't do something endovascular. I want to be able to uh, do this procedure. I start off doing this procedure and then I bail and end up doing a bypass because once I get there, I realize I, it, it looks so straightforward on imaging and then at the time it isn't. And, and I think in all the circumstances, carotid endarterectomy, femoral endarterectomy, if you have an intimal flap, there's going to be trouble and significantly worse for carotid endarterectomy. Um, my question for the authors was, why do you think it is that females have preferentially more disease in that region? And we see that that also seems to complicate aneurysm repair and the rate of growth of aneurysms in women. Claire? You're on mute. Is your clear? Do you have? Hey. Any, um, any thoughts? Um, I, I'm not exactly sure why 
there be more distribution of disease in that area in women? I know it's, as you mentioned, more prevalent there. And that's why we had a higher rate of interventions um, in women in this group, but I'm not sure as to the underlying pathology. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I, I know. Think, uh, I was going to say, I think it's pretty well, it's pretty well understood, right, right that these sort of patterns of atherosclerosis are, are definitely genetic or excuse me, can be gender-based. We see a high prevalence of distal aortic, almost exophytic type atherosclerosis in the sort of younger female smoker, which is which is who the traditional aortic iliac endorectomy I think is best for. As to why, I mean, I think, you know, the native aorta is smaller um, to start with. I think that's probably the simplest solution um, we didn't, this is, a, you know, this is a description of our case series. We weren't trying to dive into the, the, you know, cellular level differences between men and women, why they tend to have this. But I will say, you know, both in the literature and anecdotally, these sort of coral reef things are definitely preferential to, to female patients. And, and the fact that thoughts. the primary patency in the visceral group was so poor, um, and and primary assisted was better. I mean, it leaves the possibility that if you can't do something endovascular and you go in and even if you do partially open, partial endarterectomy and then partially stenting, just to make sure that your distal intimal point is is well maintained. I'm I'm wondering if any of the cases had that happen simultaneously. Um, or if cases beyond that have happened where you've you've started off and thought, well, we really didn't have a good endpoint, so we're gonna sort of do what we've done here, patch everything up, and then then go in and stent immediately and not wait for complications. Yeah, I think- You know, um, that's a, that's- Go ahead, Dr. Pierce. Well, I was gonna say, I think that's, that's an excellent point. I mean, I think that's where the completion duplex study is critical. Um, and stenting it right then and there, we did that not that long ago um, on a, on a, a acute sort of mesenteric um, case did. Um, the, I think the reason for the endpoint problems in the visceral segment has to do with the e eversion technique, um, which one of us preferentially likes to do. Um, and so I think that the main reason for that. Um, and I can tell you the one that I had that ended down the road. If I could, if I could just interject, um, having seen Ron Stoney do a number of these, um, he preferred doing it through a medial visceral rotation, and he would extend his dissection way out onto, you know, he would be five and six centimeters out on the SMA, as well as on the celiac. Um, it's not that long there, but... Um, and if he really didn't get an endpoint, he was really a master at getting endpoints. If he put in tacking sutures in a carotid endpoint, he would feel bad about himself. Um, but for the SMA, he would often, if he couldn't get a good endpoint, then do a separate longitudinal arteriotomy on the SMA, going down the SMA, uh, get a good endpoint tack if you had to and put a patch there. Um, but I, I always, my impression, the real um, hard part about this is picking who you're going to do it with. And if you get too deep, that uh, the residual adventitia, are you really going to be scared about it or not? I mean, we've all done carotid endarterectomy, and you take out a deep medial plane where a femoral endarterectomy guy, oh my God, there's nothing left. And then two minutes later, when the it, it kind of toughens up and becomes more opaque, um, it's just something that you have to have a little bit of um, well experience. They were doing a lot of them um, there, but I thought the the more important thing is you know if you do it in a real calcified vessel, wind it up with nothing rather than an endpoint problem. So that's just my two cents on that. And just see a comment here um, from Ron Dahlman to everyone. I think people can see that. Just the idea that at the time of doing the endarterectomy, they were tacking things down before even closing the aortotomy. Just, you know, 
That's a possibility. I think about it for patients too, that, um, you know, I, I really don't want to put any prosthetic in there. I mean, bovine pericardial patch would be fine, but it's, uh, it's making me think the papers actually made me think about possibly trying this in more patients when, because I don't keep it really in the, in the back of my mind so much when I think, Oh man, I can't do this and I can't do that. And, and then I don't sort of bring that one forward. So I think this paper is good for that reason that I think it's going to make people think about this a little more and have this as a possibility when all other options seem, you know, futile. Thank you, Dr. Um, Boyd, for going over it. I think the, the rest is just a couple of comments that are in the chat. Yeah. And so hopefully if you're um if we are good, we'll move on. Perfect. Um I, I, I always find that all of these make me think and think maybe we should do this or go back to it. And I, I really enjoy that. So next up, we will have um, our second group, um, and Dr. Oriolo will take it away for us. All right, can everyone hear me? Very good. You can. We'll start with uh, sharing the screen here. All right. Does everyone see the uh, presentation? We don't have you sharing your screen just yet. So hold on a sec. Okay. While you're doing that, Dr. Pierce oh, apologized yeah. that he was breaking up, but there are tornadoes in Alabama, which I think is okay. We're just going to, it's okay that you broke up a little bit because there's a tornado. So. All right, is that better now? That looks great. If you'll put it in presenter mode, we'll be good to go. Okay, so can you guys hear me? We can. Very good. So again, thank you for the opportunity. What's that? Thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, event. Uh, my name is Tim DeAreo, one of the uh, vascular surgeons, the Job's Vascular Surgery Group. And um, it is an honor to be invited. And um, an interesting paper to discuss uh, today. It's the uh, association of ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms, uh, diameter with mortality in the International Consortium of Vascular Registries. So an arterial aneurysm is defined as a focal dilatation or dilation of a blood vessel with respect to the original artery. An abdominal aortic aneurysm is defined as an aortic diameter of at least one and a half times the normal diameter at the level of the renal arteries, uh, which is approximately two centimeters. Thus generally, seven of the aorta measuring three centimeters or more is considered an aortic aneurysm. The risk of abdominal aortic aneurysms increases dramatically in the presence of the following factors, age, older than 60, smoking, hypertension, and uh, Caucasian ethnicity. Of course, with aneurysms, aortic rupture is the uh, feared outcome of progressive aortic expansion. 45% of sudden deaths are caused by a rupture AAA. And data from the Centers uh, for Disease Control and Prevention stated that approximately, 9, 000, approximately 10,000 deaths were related to aortic pathology in 2019. Now, some of these were dissections, they don't really parse it out, but still a significant number there. And amongst these, this number, 59% of these were deaths um, that happened amongst men. The risk of rupture is the hey, um, Baba, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. I'm not seeing your slides move forward unless this is my problem. I'm sorry. Oh. No, actually. Presentation mode or? Jerry, remote control. Can we go back to me? Yeah, we can see yeah. you. You're sharing the wrong screen. If you if you click uh, the share screen, you will see the screen that you need to share. Go share screen right there. Uh, right here. Like me, oh. No, go up. Go up. Press the share screen. And then uh, choose one of these. Oh, there we go, that one. Yeah. 
Okay. Yes, thank you. That looks better, yeah. Okay, so, sorry about that. So are you seeing the side that starts with risk of rupture? Or just the... Uh... We are, yep. Okay. So risk of rupture is influenced by aneurysm size, uh, expansion rate, and um, aneurysm size is one of the strongest predictors. Obviously, a cumulative rupture rate in the population with samples of 25 to 40% once the diameter is greater than five centimeters. Aneurysms typically within uh, four to five centimeters have rates between 1.1 to 7% risk of rupture. Aneurysm expansion is also an important factor in small aneurysms that ordinarily have a low or a lower risk of rupture if they show rapid expansion, but a half centimeter or so in a six month period, that increased risk of rupture certainly goes up. Only approximately 50% of patients with ruptured aneurysms will actually reach the hospital. And those that reach the hospital up to 50% do not survive repair. And this underscores the importance of repairing elective conditions for the appropriate patient. The uh, Society of Vascular Surgery guidelines recommend elective repair of the patient at low slash, un, uh, sorry, acceptable surgical risk with a fusiform aneurysm greater than 5.5 centimeters. And this level 1A evidence to support this. It suggests, however, repair in women between 5 to 5.4 centimeters, but the evidence for this is not as strong to make this a recommendation over a suggestion. On our side, it is. Are the slides advancing for you guys? It says screening right now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So the United States Preventative T Service Task Force makes the following recommendations for men between 65 to 75 years of age who have ever smoked should be screened above the age of 65 um, for, with an abdominal ultrasound. The uh, task force recommends against screening for women, however. And uh, also interestingly, the Canadian Society for Vascular Surgery recommends um, not to screen for women older than 65 on a population basis, but to individualize it based on risk factors such as smoking, cerebrovascular disease, and family history. Studies have shown that larger aneurysm size at the time of elective repair is independently associated with poorer outcomes. In fact, elective aneurysm repair with endographs for aneurysms greater than six centimeters have been associated with a higher all-cause mortality, complication, and reintervention rate than smaller aneurysms. Literature also exists that shows a higher mortality for intact aneurysm repair, whether endovascular or open, for women. Studies have also shown, or prior studies have shown, worse outcomes for women uh, following ruptured aneurysm repair with a higher 30-day mortality. It also shows that their aneurysm is said to be smaller than men at the time of presentation with a rupture. So the aims of the study were really to analyze the impact of aortic diameter on mortality uh, for rupture triple A's and also compare the outcomes by sex and type of repair using data collected from the International Consortium of Vascular Registries. And I'll be turning over the presentation to our first year fellow, Dr. Lamb, who will go through the paper. Just confirm. Uh, is everyone able to see the slides? We're the not. It doesn't have that you're sharing your screen. Or do you see it, Paul? Okay. Okay. Sorry. I thought you shook your head yes. And I was like, is it me? I do. Okay. <laughs> you cannot see? No. There we go. And then if you want to just put that into presenter mode, we can see it in the PowerPoint. 
Can you see it? And go to display settings and swap the screens. Display settings. Up at the top left, there's a little carrot next to it. Oh, uh, share screen. So where it says, dis it says show taskbar, display settings, and end slideshow. Up in the top left hand corner. Up left hand. It's probably on the Zoom. This is in the uh, presentation. Oh, Open up the Zoom again. Mm -hmm. You know what? If you want to just go from here, I think we can we can do it from here. We can see it. It'll be okay. Okay. You can okay. see. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so good evening, my name is Quinn, I'm a first year fellow. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this paper. Um, as we all know, the mortality of a ruptured AAA is high despite um, improvements in perioperative care, um, centralizations of emergency vascular surgical service, as well as EGAR. Um, the diameter of an intact AAA has been shown to be a predictor of short and long-term survival after an intact AAA repair. Um, the aim of this study is to analyze the uh, impact of AAA diameter on the mortality of a ruptured AAA repair using data from the International Consortiums of Vascular Registries uh, and compare that by sex as well as types of repair. So um, some of the um, main uh, uh, findings of this study, the first is that the mean rupture AAA diameter is statistically significant um, smaller in female compared to male. Uh, females who underwent uh, repair were older compared to um, male counterparts, and that early mortality rates for females were worse in both endo as well as um, open surgical repair compared to male. And finally, the AAA diameter at the time of rupture is a predictor of early death for endovascular repair, but is not a predictor of early death for open repair. So for the methods, this is their prospective registry data using real world data um, on repair of rupture AAA open versus endo between 2010 to 2016. A total of seven countries were included in the study. The study population was 6,428. Uh, and the data that were collected included age, sex, comorbidities, year of repair, the types of approach, and the aneurysmal size. And the comorbidities that were included were cardiac disease, renal impairment, and presence of diabetes. Again, the primary outcome was to look at perioperative mortality after EVAR uh, and open surgical repair. This is a table that looks at some of the characteristics of uh, the patients included um, stratified by different countries. Uh, the mean age is between 70 to 75 years old. The proportion of female were zero to 20%. The mean diameter can vary between 7.4 to eight centimeter. And finally, the EVAR usage can vary between 7.7 to 55.6%. This is a uh, table that looks at the proportion of those who underwent repair stratified by country, um, sorry, by sex um, and type of repair based on different countries. Um, this is a table that looks at the characteristics of uh, patients who underwent uh, rupture AAA repair stratified by sex and type of procedure. The big picture for this table is that females um, were older, they had a smaller diameter, and they had less cardiac disease compared to male at the time of rupture AAA repair, and that those who underwent um, open surgical repair, both men and female, were done at a larger diameter compared to those who underwent an EVAR. This is a diagram that looks at the diameter um, of, of AAA as a continuous variable in patients who underwent EVAR, um, stratified by sex um, and its association with mortality. Um, and as you can see here, as the diameter of the AAA increases, um, the association is associated with a higher rate of mortality. 
and that the confidence interval, interestingly for females, is significantly larger uh, in females compared to male EVARs, uh, showing a higher variability. This association was not uh, observed for open AAA um, repair. Um, this is a, a good table that shows uh, predictors of early mortality um, stratified by sex as well as type of repair. Um, as you can see here, these are odds ratios and um, in parentheses are the confidence interval. So age was a significant predictor um, in all groups of um, mortality. Patients who had cardiac disease um, um, had a, an association with mortality only in the group that underwent open surgical repair. Uh, renal impairment was associated with uh, mortality in all groups except females who underwent open surgical repair. And then finally, uh, AAA diameter was associated with mortality only in the EVAR group, but this was not observed in um, the open surgical group. So in conclusion, the study findings include um, that the diameter of a AAA at rupture presentation was an independent predictor of mortality in males and females, and that this association is significant in patients who underwent an EVAR but that the diameter of a AAA has no impact on patient mortality uh, who underwent open surgical repair at the time of rupture. Uh, patients who underwent EVAR for rupture AAA had a significantly uh, lower mortality. And finally, females, although have fewer, sorry for the word, fewer comorbidities and smaller diameter of AAA at presentation um, had a significantly higher mortality rate compared to male patients. Thank you, Dr. Oriolo and Dr. Lamb for that excellent presentation. I have a couple of questions for the authors. Are the authors here today? The first question yes. I have for the authors was that they found the impact of abdominal aortic aneurysm diameter per centimeter increase on mortality was not apparent in the open repair group. Why is that? Um, I, I, the, does the patient, does the authors have any explanation as to that? Sure. Um, this is Manar Kashram. I'm the I'm one of the authors on the paper, and we have Sinead, who's also our first year um, registrar, on uh, who's the primary author of the paper on this study. Um, it's an interesting question, right? Because we are using. Can, can I just confirm that you can hear me all right? Yes. Sure. Thank you. So um, it's, a, it's a, a very interesting question because we are using large data sets of observational registry data to answer complex questions such as this. However, when we, we've published a paper a few years ago and we showed the same data from systematic reviews on elective intact aneurysms, so larger aneurysms did worse than smaller aneurysms when it came to overall survival, and this survival was worse in, in EVAR compared to open. One of the uh, suggested mechanisms is the cytokines and the thrombin in the aneurysms. You know, they tend to have inflammatory factors that with an open repair, these are removed, whereas with EVAR, they continue to grow. And the second, which is um, also likely but difficult to show, is the multiple reinterventions and potentially higher ruptures with EVARs um, following repair compared to open. But again, we have to accept that some of this data is observational and we can't get to the um, finite details of exact mechanisms, but it opens up opportunities for future studies. That's very good. That's very intriguing. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Fedor Luri had a question. Uh, looking at the population of participating countries and the uh, epidemiological data on prevalence of rupture AAAs, we can realize that the enrollment rate is extremely variable. Does this reflect the registry participation, survival to the hospital, both or some other factors? And how much did this selection bias affect the results of the study? Again, very interesting and important question that we have to address, and we have addressed that in some of the discussions. So registry data um, 
varies from one country to another. For example, in the US, to the best of my knowledge, um, VQI contributes about 30 to 40% of um, aortic procedures done, done in the US. Um, I can speak on the behalf of New Zealand where I'm in. So our validation data shows that we have 80 to 85% of aortic repair. However, in places like Sweden and the UK, their capture rate is much higher at 90 to 95%. And it gets to 99% in some European countries. So it is variable. With registry data, unfortunately, we only collect operative mortality. So patients who die in the community is not measured. And there has been other epidemiological studies to determine um, the, the, the number of capture rate and in ruptured data. So we can say that in some of those registries, the complete the capture rate has been incomplete, but in others, it hasn't been. Hopefully, with adding all the data together, it gives us a better real-world picture of what the data is trying to show and its consistency. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, Dr. An Hong asked, uh, do we know the cause of the death for the EVAR versus open patients? And are there any significant differences between the two groups? Um, unfortunately, we don't collect in most registries. The cause of death is not um, recorded in the registry. So what we know, whether they died in the hospital or they they survived their 30-day, um, the and with an open with an aneurysm rupture, you know, the most of us will define that if they died after the operation, it's an aneurysm related mortality rather than another cause because usually the death occurs occurs quite early on from the operation. So we we to answer the question directly, we don't have this data in the registry. And it's not usually collected in the majority of registries. Thank you. Um, Dr. Boyd asked uh, if there was any correlation between the neck diameters and the uh, the um and the mortality rates on these patients? Again, that's a, that's a great question. Um, with, the, with the ICVR in particular and those large registry data, not all registries collect neck diameters. So we don't have that information. I know in VQI, um, I, I, again, uh, you, you guys will know more than I do with the data collection. I think neck length and diameter is recorded and there are some um, other registries in Europe that collect this data, but it's quite difficult to look specifically using the ICVR data to these questions. But these questions can be useful um, to, to, to answer using different registries, um, such as VQI, to see if there's any correlation. And if whether there's enough power with number of patients has to be explored in a study. Dr. Dahlman had a comment uh... This comment is that triple A diameter may be less predictive of a good outcome with open surgery. And uh, that's because EVAR is frequently more complicated, takes longer, and may not be within the instruction for use. And uh, it may be, not be compliant in larger triple A with shorter, more angled necks. Would you be able to comment on that? Sure. Um, thanks, Dr. Amon, for this comment. Um, yes, we, we agree with this. Um, and, uh, but, we agree with this comment, but we don't have confirmation on how patients are selected on those registries and which patients go for open, which go for endo. We, but what we can say from the study is, and this is consistent with other studies, but from this real world data, the mortality after rupture is much lower with an endovascular first strategy. And while the randomized trials um, showed similar findings, this is real world data that supports an endovascular strategy for those patients that are suitable for an open, uh, sorry, suitable for an endovascular first strategy with the rupture. Thank you. Um, supplement table one, uh, you guys presented the, the open surgical repair versus endovascular repair stratified by country. There was a wide variability of modalities in treatment. Um, some people, 90% um, of patients, for example, in Hungary, underwent open repair for ruptured aneurysm, and 44 underwent open repair for ruptured aneurysm in the United States. Do you have any explanation on why is there such a variability? 
um, thank you for that. That's that's important. Um, each so different countries have different ways and protocols of doing things. From my understanding, in Hungary, and this was quite new to me after we wrote this paper, was in Hungary, um, it's almost illegal to turn down a patient or palliate a a patient with an open aneurysm to palliate a patient um, with a ruptured aneurysm. Almost all patients need to be operated on which is quite different to other European countries where patients who are highly comorbid or rest home are offered palliative treatment and not um, offered surgery. I think the logistics of um, open surgery, the way vascular surgery is centralized in Hungary means that open, it's it's clearer to do uh, or um, an open aneurysm compared to EVAR, whereas in other countries, especially that vascular surgeons now operate in hybrid suites and perform endovascular treatment themselves rather than radiology. Um, that's that's what um, makes some of these variations between countries. Thank you very much for that great. Yeah, sorry, ahead, thank Dr. you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Pham, for all the great questions and to the audience as well for the great questions. And, and also thank you for being here from New Zealand. Um, luckily it's 11, it's 11 a.m., right? It's not 11 p.m. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, getting close to 12. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, yep, it's daylight hours. Okay. We like these meetings. <laughs> well, feel free to join us on May 8th whenever we have our next event. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, again, we'll be back in May, um, uh, and all of the dates are published on vascular.org so that you can uh, sign up, and we'll see you back. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you, Misty. Thank you, all your hosts and authors. Appreciate it. April and Poe.